Welcome to Bristol Chem Labs here at the School of Chemistry, University of Bristol. My name is Tim Harrison, I'm one of the academic staff here in the department. It's traditional on a face-to-face -face top of the bench competition to have a short lecture demonstration while the judges calculate who has won first, second and third prize. Unfortunately, this year we can't have a face-to-face, -face, so we're going to have a virtual lecture demonstration. So I'm stood here in a lecture theatre, completely empty, surrounded by a whole bank of cameras and chemicals. We're going to, have to take this opportunity to look at some of the gases in the air and do some of the experiments that's not necessarily possible to do in your schools. I want to start off by looking at the low density gases that I've got in the balloons uh, behind me. On this side, I have one of the two low density gases that will make balloons float, and that happens to be hydrogen, the simplest uh, chemical that exists, the H2 molecule. It makes up 99.9% .9 of the universe. You've all done the pop test. In doing a pop test in school, you probably only used a few cubic centimetres of gas. Here I've got about 5,000 cubic centimetres. It will be the bigger pop test. And just as a comparison, I've got a balloon filled with helium, the normal party balloon gas. And we'll make a start with the helium. Depending on where you are in your chemistry, of course, you will know some of the properties, the chemical properties of helium and those of hydrogen. Let's see why we choose helium balloons for party balloons, not hydrogen ones. So helium, absolutely no flame. Nice loud bang though in this echoey lecture theatre. Hydrogen. Far louder, more flame, more chemistry going on. So that's two simple gases, hydrogen and helium. In the air that you're sucking in, your lungs at the moment, each of those makes up a mere one part per billion of the atmosphere. Let's go to the biggest gas that we have in our atmosphere, and that is nitrogen. You're breathing in about 78% nitrogen in the air going into your lungs. Nitrogen, the biggest simple single component of your atmosphere. Nitrogen gas is boring, it's odourless, colourless, tasteless, it's non-combustible and we can show you why it's non-combustible in that if it were combustible, nitrogen would be reacting with oxygen in the atmosphere. In doing so, it would make nitrogen dioxide and other nitrogen oxide gases. And just so that you know how we would notice that, I'm going to make some NO2 here. Nitrogen dioxide, NO2, particularly poisonous material. I've just got some copper there and some concentrated nitric acid. This is how we would recognise NO2 if it were in our atmosphere. This is what we would be seeing. Rather than colourless mixture of gases in the air, we'd see an awful lot of NO2, which is fairly distinctive. Let's stop that reaction by diluting the acid with some water. If you were in the lecture theatre at this point, you would actually be noticing uh, the smell of chlorine. Nitrogen dioxide gas smells very similar to that of chlorine. Nitrogen as a gas, it can be useful. We've got some polystyrene foam here. Polystyrene foam, not polystyrene. This is a mixture. It contains polystyrene, yes, but most of what you're seeing there is gas. Polystyrene foam has a lot of gas in it. These days we tend to use a lot of nitrogen to make polystyrene foam. To give you an idea, I'm going to get rid of the gas from the foam to show you how little space the polystyrene takes up. Here I've got the active ingredient in nail varnish remover. It's given a couple of names. The old-fashioned name is acetone and that's what's written on this bottle. The name that's used in schools is the correct one. That's propanone. Just watch what happens. I'm not melting the polystyrene foam. There's no heat involved. And as you can probably tell, I'm not dissolving the polystyrene foam either. I'm simply disrupting the structure to release the gas that is in there, inflating it. How much gas is in there? Well, here's a simple experiment to give you some idea. There is a litre of 
polystyrene packing pieces, polystyrene foam packing pieces. If I use the same solvent here, we'll just put it into that top and we'll see how much polystyrene, even though it's green colored polystyrene, there is in a liter of packing. Not a great deal. So most of expanded polystyrene, most of polystyrene foam is gas. Let's look at liquid nitrogen. The beauty about working in chemistry at the university means that we can play with liquid nitrogen. Specialized container called a Dewar flask. It allows me to pick it up, even though it will be filled with one of the coldest liquids in the universe, liquid nitrogen. This is liquid nitrogen. It has a boiling point of minus 196 degrees centigrade, or if you prefer, 220 degrees centigrade colder than the air in this lecture theater. The nitrogen is boiling. It's simply taking heat away from the inside piece of glassware of the two pieces I have here, and is using it to break apart the intermolecular bonds. The white stuff coming off the top obviously is not nitrogen. You would have noticed if nitrogen was white since it's 78% of the air. What we're doing here is making cloud by condensing water vapour into billions of droplets of liquid water, tiny droplets, and that's what cloud is. I can demonstrate this with the water vapour from my own breath. Now we're seeing something rather gross. You're seeing the water vapour that was in my lungs one second beforehand. We'll add a bit more. We have plenty. A few simple experiments. First experiment uses a piece of Bunsen burner hose, piece of rubber tubing. It's been in here in the lecture theatre for a few days now, so we know its temperature. It's at room temperature, which bizarrely makes this 220 degrees centigrade hotter than that liquid because the liquid is 220 degrees colder than the air. If I put the end in, this is what happens. You can make it rain nitrogen. If you want to, you can even have a shower in the stuff, but that's not recommended. Now, why it's boiling off should be obvious to all of you present. The heat that was in the bottom part of this non-conductor has been given away to the liquids, caused some of the liquid to boil. That in turn has pushed out any unsuspecting droplets of liquid that have got in the way, and it only stops when the bottom part of the tubing is the same temperature as the liquid. This piece here is dangerously cold. It's so cold, if I was to hold onto that for five seconds, my flesh would freeze to its surface, and when I pulled it away, bits of my dead flesh would be left on the tubing. I'm not going to be doing that. I like my fingers to work. Cold temperature dangers are called cryohazards. By the way, we've changed some of the physical characteristics of the tubing by cooling it down. The warm end is still flexible, it's still malleable. The long polymer chains can still fly over each other when you bend it. The cold bit, I can't bend. The polymer chains have insufficient energy to slide past each other. So it's gone from being flexible to being rigid. And just in case the microphone is working well enough here, warm rubber sounds like this. Cold rubber. A change in sound properties, sonorous properties, which are another physical property that is temperature dependent. Why am I not using safety gloves? If you were in the laboratories doing practicals in your... Uh, Top of the bench competition, you'd been wearing gloves of one description or another. I'm not using them with, uh, with liquid nitrogen. I'm going to show you why. These are latex rubber gloves, stretchy at room temperature. Let's put one in the liquid. Now, I'm not sticking my fingers in the liquid because that would be stupid. If you put your fingers in liquid nitrogen for five seconds, your flesh will freeze through the bone. You can then snap your fingers off. And I like my fingers to work. So... Why am I not using gloves? This is why. At cold temperatures, they're far too brittle, so they wouldn't actually bend with your hand. If you warm them up, you can get them to stretch. Now that's a reversible physical process. Are there reversible chemical processes? Yes. I've got one here. In fact, I've got two here. And we'll set these off. I'll talk to you about these later. Let's just shake those up. Colour change is the sign of a chemical reaction. It's one of the signs of a potential chemical reaction. 
and you can see that these are two sets of reactions. We'll put them to the side and leave them for a few minutes. While I'm doing that, let's consider what happens to common things in cold temperatures. Here I've got a balloon filled full of air. So this was simply pumped in earlier rather than being blown up. So the air inside that balloon is the same as the air in this lecture theatre. Question, and scientists are always posing questions and then working out what the answer is. What would happen to the size of this balloon if I was to cool it down in liquid nitrogen? Now size can't go bang, okay? Balloons can go bang, size can't. In fact, if I break the balloon, I've st stuffed up the experiment. Size will either get bigger, get smaller, or stay the same. Let's see what happens. Well, there's what happens. It shrinks. The volume gets smaller. What happens when we warm the balloon up in the lovely warm air in this lecture theatre here in Bristol? Well, it gets bigger again you should be able to work out what is happening inside the balloon. Are the gas particles, the air particles that are in the balloon, when they're cold, do they simply shrink? Do these atoms and molecules shrink? Or do they simply get closer together? And when it warms up, do the particles expand or do they simply move further apart? Is it size, is it distance? Let's give it a look. Let's investigate. So here we've got two thick pieces of glassware. We've got a sidearm conical flask. There's a little spout here. As you can see. Let's imagine we could pour 35 cubic centimetres of liquid nitrogen into each. Now this is a guesstimate. You can't use a measuring cylinder when it's, the liquid is simply going to boil when it hits the warm surface. Let's do something stupid, let's seal a system and see if you can figure out what's going to happen and more importantly, why it's happening. If you don't know why it did that, have a word with your science, your chemistry teachers. We'll do one more experiment as we've got some liquid nitrogen left. Most of you have seen a waterfall, but I doubt whether you've seen a liquid nitrogen fall. That should clean the floor up and help out our cleaning staff. Okay, that's nitrogen. Let's look at oxygen. It's oxygen that's bringing about the colour changes here, although this one is a bit slower than this one. But if we shake that up, we can see it's reversible. When you're shaking it up, it's oxygen from the air that's reacting, forming a different colour of the mixture of chemicals that are in the solution. It's a complicated piece of chemistry called redox. And you'll find out more about that when you go on to study post-16 chemistry, A-levels or, or other qualifications. So oxygen is a reactive material. Oxygen is made for us by plants. Photosynthesis itself is a complex piece of chemistry. We don't have time to go into the complexity of photosynthesis here, but we can make use of oxygen. We're going to perform the classic chemistry demonstration experiment called the elephant's toothpaste. Now this is a messy experiment, that's why I'm using such a delicate tablecloth here. I'm going to make some oxygen from this material. This is hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is essentially a water molecule, H2O, with an extra oxygen atom chemically attached. It links HOOH by single covalent bonds. I'm going to add in about 200 cubic centimetres of the stuff. The thing about hydrogen peroxide is it's unstable. It wants to break apart or dissociate, decompose. Lots of ways we could phrase that. It's breaking apart at the moment. Just add a bit of food colouring there to make it easier to see. 
What you probably can't see in there are any bubbles. Maybe it's because you're too far away from the camera, but let's find out if there's any bubbles at all. Let's add some best washing up liquid. Let's give that a mix up, because oh, washing up liquid floats on the top of hydrogen peroxide, and we want it evenly mixed or made homogenous. There's a few bubbles there, but I guess that's the bubbles that's been created while I've been swirling. The thing about hydrogen peroxide decomposition is that it's a slow chemical change. And there are ways to speed up chemical changes. I'm going to use one of those tricks up a chemist's sleeve, and that's to use a catalyst. Catalysts simply speed up reactions without themselves getting used up. This is a catalyst, one of many for this reaction. So let's drop in some catalyst and look at the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide into oxygen gas and back into water. Catalyst speed up reactions. I'd love to stick my fingers into that lot of foam, but I didn't because that foam is hotter than boiling water. It's a highly exothermic reaction. Uh, the stuff that's coming off the top, of course, isn't steam. Steam's colourless, as I'm sure you all know. That's simply condensed water vapour. And I'm going to ask uh, Johnny here, Dr. First, to come in and remove this. He's got his safety glasses on. He's got his uh, gloves on. So you'll simply wrap that up and we'll take it to the labs a little later and get that cleaned up. But oxygen is needed not just uh, to keep us alive through the process, of course, called respiration, not breathing. Breathing simply putting any old gas in and out of your lungs. Respiration is where the chemistry goes on inside your mitochondria in your cells. We also need oxygen for combustion. We saw combustion with hydrogen earlier, but I thought I'd show you a second form of combustion here. I'm going to burn a chemical called methanol. Methanol is a fuel for drag racing cars. It's a biofuel. It has a simple chemical formula. Its formula is CH3OH. And I'm just going to pour some into this old water container, this water distribution bottle. Just a small measured amount. Methanol you need to be careful with. Methanol will pass through your skin into your blood supply, causing irreversible brain damage and death. So I'm shaking this up carefully to avoid it touching my skin. And I'm going to pour out the surplus of the liquid. All of you have studied, I hope, the fire triangle when you were baby chemists. How do you get things to burn? Fuel down one side of the triangle, oxygen from the air down the other and across the bottom a bit of heat energy. How on earth would we expect liquid methanol to burn? How can the molecules in the bottom of that beaker possibly be in contact with oxygen in the air? The answer is they can't. It's the vapour that burns, the fumes if you like, that the methanol gives off. Now I've just drained out the liquid from this container. So the container contains a fuel-air mixture. And fuel air mixtures are explosive. If you put an explosive mixture into a sealed container, you call the container a bomb. Now, if you were live here in the or lecture theatre, I'd have to put a safety screen up to prevent any possibility of you being hit by any flying plastic. But since you're not here, I don't need to get one put up. I'm simply going to Get the lights turned down. I'm going to put some flame in, some activation energy into my fuel air mixture. And we'll turn the lights off to make it easier to see the colour of the flame that gets produced during the combustion of the vapour. Okay, so unlike the flame coming off my butane gas fueled Bunsen burner, my camping gas Bunsen burner, where we've got a yellow flame due to highly excited soot particles, carbon atoms producing that yellow flame, the flame that came out of burning the methanol was blue. And just like a Bunsen burner, yellow flames incomplete combustion, blue flames complete combustion. We're getting all the energy out of our fuel air mixture with the blue flame than we are with the yellow flame. In fact, the yellow flame 
actually it won't burn your skin provided you pass it through quite quickly. Just don't leave it there because then you will get burnt. What happens to the, the fuel itself, the fuel oxygen mixture? Two things. The carbon in my methanol formula, CH3OH, gets turned to carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide produced by fossil fuel burning, of course, and other fuel burning produces the dreaded gas that causes climate change. The other thing, the hydrogen in the fuel gets turned into water, hydrogen oxide. So when you burn fuels, you both get carbon dioxide and water. Now, is burning in oxygen the only way you can burn a fuel? Well, no, it isn't. When you do a lot more chemistry, you'll find there are other ways to burn that don't use oxygen gas, but they do use materials called oxidizing agents. So, for this I need a heat-proof mat. I've got the fuel here that we use to stay alive, and that's the fuel called glucose. I've got a small amount of glucose there. A nice white powder. This is the C6H1206 that some of you will have met in your photosynthesis uh, equations. And here I've got an oxidizing agent. Glucose as a fuel needs a source of oxygen in order to burn. An oxidizing agent can produce that oxygen. Now I've got one white powder with a second white powder. Um, powder on powder reactions don't work well unless you can mix them up. Just like cookery when you're making a cake, if you don't get all the ingredients evenly mixed up, it ain't gonna work. You need the oxidizer to be physically in contact with the fuel in order for the fuel to chemically react and release the energy from the reaction. To get this going, I've got some concentrated sulfuric acid. And we'll do this in slight dark to be able to see the reaction in such a small quantity more easily. Okay? Now the combustion isn't a complete combustion as you can see for yourselves. We have some carbon present, so we've got some soot, if you like, the dark, darker particles. And you saw a smoke. Smoke is not a gas. Smoke are fine particles of dust. Some of that dust will actually be vaporized and then condensed uh, sugar, and others will actually be some of the carbon that's in the air. If we leave the air still for a long, a long period of time, several hours, those dust particles of this smoke will come down and cover everything with a fine layer of solids and solid dust. So there's a combustion type that might be new to you. I'm going to now look at some carbon dioxide. I've got some over here out of shot. I brought a box of carbon dioxide here, a small amount of carbon dioxide. Instead of using carbon dioxide gas, I've got the carbon dioxide in the solid state. This is pure carbon dioxide. It looks like ice. There is absolutely no water present, so its nickname is dry ice. And the thing you have to be very careful about with dry ice is that the, this solid is at least minus 78 degrees centigrade. And if you kept it in contact with any one part of your skin for any length of time, it will cause severe frostbite. Moving it from one bit of flesh to the other with some smaller mats as I'm doing doesn't allow any frostbite to form. I want to do just two experiments with this dry ice. One simply uses a frying pan. There is a normal frying pan available from Sainsbury's. it do that? I'm not going to tell you. What I am going to do, in the last but one experiment here, is take some dry ice and add it to an alkaline solution. So to do this we'll get some normal tap water, we'll add a bit of that in there. To make it easier to see, 
we'll add some uh, white boards because we got a dark bench here. Now, tap water on its own, not particularly interesting. Let's add some universal indicator solution, some pH indicator. Tap water, of course, is not pH 7. It contains minerals, which makes it very weakly alkaline. Let's make it strongly alkaline. We've got some sodium hydroxide, so we'll have the pH from 11 to 14. Just a small amount of sodium hydroxide. So that shows the typical purple color of pH 11 to 14. Watch what happens to the color as we drop in the dry ice and figure out for yourselves why this is happening. Okay, you can see it on the yellow and if we leave it a moment longer, that will turn orange. It will not turn red. We've got a bit of physics going on in there. We've got some state changes. The solid carbon dioxide is becoming carbon dioxide gas. Some of that carbon dioxide gas is coming out of the beaker, hitting the cold water, cooling down the water vapor that lives above the liquid level and condenses that into clouds. So we've got water turning into water, just different states. Some of the solid carbon dioxide becoming carbon dioxide gas, another state change, sublimation in this time. Remember the water is 102 degrees hotter than the sublimation temperature of the dry ice, so the solid carbon dioxide is becoming gaseous carbon dioxide. Some of it's coming out and cooling, the other is actually going in and reacting with the sodium hydroxide solution. And you've seen what happens in terms of the color change and therefore the pH going from a strongly alkaline solution down to a weakly acidic one. Carbon dioxide in water forms carbonic acid. Okay, we'll finish this up with a couple more demonstrations. As we've got a lecture theatre here, we can control the lights. I thought I'd finish with two more balloons. Both of these are hydrogen, and you'll find out why they're hydrogen in a moment. I want to set fire to them, one with the light on and one with the light off. I want you to concentrate this time on the flame. The volume of flame is the volume of reacting gas. Consider why the volume of reacting gas is much larger than the volume of the balloon. In the daytime, it's quite hard to see, but we'll, we will give it a go. Hydrogen in the light. And we will finish this by hydrogen in the dark. This is the last experiment of the uh, virtual lecture demonstration. I hope you've enjoyed the competition. Good luck to the winners. Cheerio.